treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up by be a fool. You are my Any of you ever read the, the book, I'll Love You Forever? Anyone? Raise your hand. Oh. The only thing that makes me cry more is Christmas shoes, which should never have been made into a movie. should be against the law. But a very, very happy Mother's Day to all of you. Very happy Mother's Day to all of you who are watching uh, our live stream, including my wife, who is at home healing. My mother-in-law, happy birthday, ladies. We are in Luke chapter 1 today. The title of our message is Blessed Motherhood. Blessed Motherhood. Luke chapter 1, the Word of God says in verse 26, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Today we're going to be talking about blessed motherhood. And as we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this day that we can celebrate godly mothers the ones who gave birth to us, the ones who poured into us and helped shape us into the people that we are today. Father, I pray that that would be a very special day for every mother in this room. Father, we're also mindful of those who have very much wanted to be mothers but have not been blessed in that way. There are those here today that have lost children, whether in the womb or whether uh, at some other point. And Father, there are those whose mothers have recently passed. I think about my own mother that passed less than two years ago. And so, Father, while this is a time of celebration for many, it's also a time of grieving for others But I pray that you would help us today. 
to focus in on the goodness of God. And as we celebrate motherhood, we celebrate you, our eternal Father, because of the beauty of your design and the great gift that you have provided through our mothers. And as we look today towards the idea of being blessed in motherhood, I pray that you would fill us with convictions from the Word of God. I pray that you would challenge us where we all need to be challenged. And I pray that you would strengthen us and cause us to rejoice today. And so, Father, we celebrate your goodness and your mercy. And as we open up the Word of God and exposit what it says today, I pray that you would help us to know you better. I pray that you would help us to serve you more. And may the driving force and motivator behind that be the love of God, which has been shed abroad in our hearts. May the love of Christ compel us. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, then I pray that they would come to know him today. And if there are ones here, whether men or women, that need to grow closer to you and stronger with you in our walk, then I pray that that would be accomplished as a result of having been exposed to the Word of God and the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we dedicate this message and this time to you. And at the end of our service today, whenever we, three, whenever we dedicate three young men to the living God today, may that be a blessing in their families and to all of us as a congregation because we are all one family in the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed motherhood. You know, Mary was a very godly young woman. When she became pregnant with the Lord Jesus, she was young. We, we really don't know how young she was. She could have been anywhere from 14 to 16 years of age. She was highly favored because she was chosen by God to bear his only begotten son. And when Mary learned that she was going to be giving birth to the Messiah... She had absolutely no idea about all the twists and all the turns that would take place in her life. All we know is that after the shepherds came, then she did on that occasion what I'm absolutely convinced that she did throughout the rest of her life. The Bible says that she pondered these things in her heart. Coming back to Verse 28, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. My question this morning is, why was she so blessed? Why was she so blessed? And here's what I want to propose to all the mothers and to the fathers, to everyone in this room. When your life is no longer your own, but God's, then you will be truly blessed. When your life is no longer yours, but God's, then and only then will you truly be blessed. As we want to answer the question, why was she so blessed, our first response is because she accepted God's plan for her life. Because she accepted God's plan for her life. You know, every young Jewish girl had hopes and dreams of the future. And I think that it was in the heart of every young Jewish woman, maybe I'll be the one that will give birth to the Messiah. Maybe it will be me. But it will come with a price. And Mary realized that price. She would bear the shame of being an unwed mother, the possible misunderstanding of Joseph, accusations from the religious leaders. Remember that adultery was a crime. And actual, actually possibly death. According to the law, she should have been stoned to death if the accusations had been true. But we also find that she had great faith. She had a deep relationship with God. And she knew that there was absolutely no safer place for her than to be in God's will. That's where she wanted to be, and that's where she wanted to stay. He would make everything okay. Take a look with me at verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You know, the word 
maidservant is basically another name for slave. She made herself to be the slave of God and to his will. God made his will known to Mary, and she accepted his plan for her life in humility. She embraced the will of God, and because of that, that made her blessed. And so I want to say to you, and I'd like to say to me this morning, have you accepted God's plan for your life, your overall plan? There are some of us that fight the revealed will of God in our lives, and as long as we do that, we will never truly be blessed. But we will be blessed of God whenever we make ourselves his slaves and to bow down to his will and to say along with the Lord Jesus, not my will, but your will be done in my life. I promise you, church, if you do that, then you too will know what it means to be completely blessed of God. But second, she's blessed because of her praise. You know, how many of us, I guess, have been affected by the movies or maybe by teaching uh, by some teachers in the past, especially when we were kids? And whenever we, whenever we envision Mary, we kind of envision her as being very meek and very mild and very delicate and very quiet. Can I propose this morning that that is not the way Mary was at all? Now, she wasn't a loud mouth, but I believe that she knew how to praise God. I believe that a lot of us need to take lessons on how to praise God. Amen? She praised God because of his special favor upon her. Take a look with me at verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant, of his slave. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. She praises God because of his special favor upon her. She refers to God as her Savior. You know why she did that? Because contrary to some doctrine that is taught by some churches, Mary needed a Savior. You know why? Because she was a sinner before God, and she needed to be saved. And she praises God for His faithfulness, for His power, for His holiness. She praises God for His mercy. And in her praise, she uses a deep knowledge of the Scriptures, she quotes Hannah. She makes allusions to the law and the prophets and the Psalms from the Old Testament. She praises God because of the special favor that he had upon the nation of Israel. Look at verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Through the birth of the Messiah, part of the covenant that God made with Abraham is fulfilled. In you and in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, God said to Father Abraham. And here's the picture of Mary's praise as she lets it burst forth. It was not a quiet bowing of the head, okay? It was not something that was whispered. Her worship was internal, and because it was so strong and so powerful in her that it could not help but burst forth audibly and visibly as people were in her presence. She was so consumed with the reality of God. She was so consumed with the wonder of God that she let her praise come forth with abandon. And that's really the idea as we interact with the text here. It couldn't be contained. It had to come out. In fact, the Greek word translated exalts is megalumni. And that basically means to cause to swell or to grow on the inside. The New King James translates that word magnify. And here's the picture. 
It has in it the idea of something small, and then you place a magnifying glass over it, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, the Greek word magnify has in it the idea of something that becomes super large in the presence of the human being. And whenever she praises God, the language that she uses is absolutely beautiful. The language in the Greek New Testament is large, and it's profound, and it's a little bit different than what we would imagine with that meek Mother Mary figure that we sometimes have in our minds or in books. She said that she rejoiced in God, her Savior. That word rejoice is actually a really powerful word. It's an awesome word. It's the same word that Peter used whenever he made this statement. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever praised God with abandon? Do you know what it means to audibly make much of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know what it means to praise him in a way that you're not concerned about what other people think? But your praise before God is completely unrestrained. It is not held back, but you let it freely flow. Whenever you and I can learn to do that without thinking twice about what those around us think of us, then we will begin to learn what it means to be blessed, to worship God with abandon. Can I be honest with you? I don't care what anybody thinks whenever I praise God because I'm not praising people, am I? I don't seek the approval of people whenever I praise God. And I want to tell you, when you are completely and unashamedly in love with Jesus, then we'll praise him in this way. And we'll be blessed of God. Third, she is blessed because of the things that she experienced. She experienced the Christmas story. The difficult trip from Nazareth to, Nazareth to Bethlehem, over 70 miles of traveling. Can you imagine traveling for 70 miles, walking some of the way, perhaps riding on a donkey the rest of the way when you're nine months pregnant? First of all, I can't even imagine being pregnant. <laughs> By the way, women are the most beautiful of God's creation. But thank God I was born a man. <laughs> Can I get a witness, amen? <laughs> Traveling in the mountains, good grief. Giving birth to God in a cave. The visit of the shepherds, the, she, the first proclamation made about her son that he's the Messiah publicly, the visit from the, from the wise men. Can you imagine being Mary and seeing someone bowing down and worshiping your son? She observed the gifts that were given and the significance of each gift. They represented the wealth of the nations that would come to Christ during his thousand-year reign. Can you imagine seeing prophecy fulfilled literally right before your eyes? In fact, it's not really hard to imagine, Matt, because, my goodness, are there any prophecies left to be fulfilled before Jesus returns? None at all. None. He can come back any time. His return is imminent. Here's what was written. Isaiah 60, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. Uh, it goes on to say, and all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. They shall proclaim the praises of of the Lord and these gifts that were given to the Lord Jesus as he was just a little guy foreshadowed not only the character of Jesus' life, gold representing purity, incense, the fragrance of his life, myrrh, his sacrifice and death. Can you imagine the great responsibility of raising the Son of God? I can't. 
seeing him take his first steps, kissing him when he slipped and scraped his knee, listening to him question the teachers of the law when he was 12, watching with, with pride as he went through his passage into manhood, prodding him to perform his first miracle at the wedding in Cana. See, all of her experiences in raising Jesus caused her to be blessed. But number four, Mary was blessed through Jesus' death. And that's when we turn to John 19. When Jesus was taken to the temple to be circumcised as an infant, there was a man there named Simeon. We've actually preached on Simeon before. Uh, I believe it was on a Christmas Eve service one year. He prophesied concerning Mary whenever he spoke these words. And listen as I quote from Luke 2. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Then he turns and looks at Mary and he says, Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And I, I can't help but think that her mind went back to that moment in Jesus' infancy. And she recalled the words of Simeon and what he prophesied over the baby Jesus whenever she's standing there at the cross and watching her son die as his life was being poured out like water as an offering for the sins of the world. She witnessed the shame. We're in John 19. Take a look with me at verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says they divided my garments among them, and from my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister. The tunic was an undergarment. Jesus may or may not have been wearing a loincloth. We really don't know. But by and large, he was crucified naked. This corresponds with Hebrews 12.2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, Jesus is referred to as the last Adam. The Bible also says that we were in Adam whenever he sinned. And the Bible says, likewise, that those who are part of God's elect were in Christ as his life was being sacrificed. Everything that we had in Adam died at the cross. And everything that we have in Christ came alive with him at the resurrection, but as he is dying on the cross and he is suspended between heaven and hell, it's interesting that as he dies naked, as the last Adam, he is the one that closed the nakedness of our sins. Just like God did with Adam and Eve after Adam sinned in the garden, whenever he sacrificed the animals and made clothes from the skins to cover them. Even so, Jesus, as he is writhing there in shame and humiliation, naked, is making preparation for our sins to be covered, to be forgiven, to be clothed, so to speak, so that we wouldn't have to experience the shame and degradation of being separated from a holy God. But even though all this is going on, Jesus is concerned about his mom. Take a look with me at verse 25. Now there stood by the cross there, the 
cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. In complete contrast to the soldiers gambling for the garment of Jesus, Jesus Jesus notices his mother, and she's weeping, and he wants to comfort her. He makes sure that she's going to be cared for after he has departed this life. And she watched Jesus die. You know, just as she was there whenever he drew his first breath into this world, likewise she was there as he drew his last breath. In this life. Look at verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. I'm going to tell you something that most all of you already know, but just in case you did not know this, I want you to understand something. Whenever Jesus said it is finished, what he meant by that was was that the sacrifice had been completed. And you can come to God because of what Jesus did on the cross for you. And you can have your sins forgiven. And you can know that you're going to be with God forever in heaven. But beyond that, you can know in this life that you are right with God. See, some of you have been searching your entire lives for a joy and a peace that has up until this point eluded you. But you can know today what it means to be completely forgiven. To have all of your sins washed away by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And you can leave here today on this Mother's Day knowing that you have been saved and leaving would join your hearts that this world can never possibly give you. You know why? Because this world can't understand that type of love. It can't understand that type of joy because it's a love and a joy and a peace that only comes from God. Now, I'm not promising you that everything's going to be great after you get saved, okay? because I would be misleading you if I said that. But what I am telling you is, is that no matter what happens in this life, as crazy as this world is, you can know that things are right between your soul and the God who created it. And in order to experience that love and that acceptance by the God of the universe today, then you must enter into relationship with him via Jesus Christ. He is the one that makes it all possible. And when you confess to God that you're a sinner before him, and you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins based upon what he did for you on that cross and for rising again from the dead, and you receive that as a free gift, that gift of forgiveness, then salvation is yours. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus died for everyone. It is receiving that gift of eternal life is what matters to you today. Pastor, how can you possibly say that Mary was blessed as she watched her son die? I'll tell you. She was blessed because he died for her sins as well. She, like all godly individuals from the Old Testament looked for the coming of the Messiah to free her from the shackles of sin. And through his wounds, she herself would be spiritually healed. She was blessed in the same way that you can be blessed today. If you trust your soul to God and his eternal salvation. See, she was saved. She was justified. She became the righteousness of God in her son, in the Lord Jesus. Christ became the end of the law for her. And when she hears her son utter that phrase, it is finished, she was no longer bound by commandment keeping. 
but she was adopted by the Father. And that's why she was blessed. Just as the parent carried the child, and then the child carried the parent in our story a few minutes ago, so Jesus now carried his mother and did what she could not do for herself. But finally, she was blessed because of the resurrection. You see, the resurrection proved his deity. It proved that he was who he said he was. It it proved that Christ's work on the cross, his cross work, was accepted by the Father. And Mary knew that because her son rose from the dead, that she too was going to rise from the dead. His resurrection proved that he would return one day and that he would fulfill the promise to reign as king over Israel and the world. She was blessed because now she was vindicated. See, she, her, her whole adult life, she had this dark cloud that was looming over her. The accusations, they, the religious leaders even said to, to Jesus at one point, they said, do we not say rightly that you're a Roman? They said all kinds of things about Mary. They speculated that she had premarital sex with Joseph. They, they suspected that she'd been raped by a Roman soldier. They speculated all kinds of things. And she had that dark cloud that was hovering over her, but now she was vindicated because her son had come alive from the dead, never to die again. It proved that she didn't lie. (laughs) That, That she was not guilty of anything that she'd been accused of 33 years earlier. She was blessed in that after Jesus rose from the dead that her other sons and daughters would believe in Jesus as Savior. Did you know that all of Jesus' half-brothers and sisters had rejected him up until this point? But what could they do whenever they saw that their older brother had risen from the dead? It was an in-your-face thing. There was nothing they could do at that point but believe. And because of that, the circle in her family would not be broken. In fact, her son James would go on to pastor the church in Jerusalem, and he would write the book of James. Jesus' half-brother Jude would write the book that bears his name. She was blessed because she and her family were present in the upper room where they continued in prayer together. Listen as I read the Word of God. Acts 1.12, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Uh, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. The 11 uh, disciples were there. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, speaking of his natural brothers. You know, Mary was blessed. Her life speaks of a blessed motherhood. And God would remind each and every one in here today, including me, including you, that you and I have been blessed for the same reasons as Mary. If we accept God's plan for our life, then we'll be blessed. If you and I learn to praise God, even through difficult or unknown circumstances, then we can be blessed of God. If we look on the things that God allows us to experience and grow from them, then we'll be blessed of God. If we allow the reality of Jesus' death to affect us, if we allow the reality of his life to affect us, to be the great change agents in our lives, then we will be blessed. But above all things, when your life is no longer yours, but it's God's, then you and I will begin to understand what it means to truly be blessed of God. Let's pray together. Father, how wonderful it is to take a look at Mary's life and to see all the different ways 
that made the angel Gabriel able to say, Rejoice, you highly favored one. You are blessed among women. Lord, what was true of Mary can directly be applied to us in our lives if we will put into practice the things that we just spoke about. Lord, as for me in my house, I want to be blessed of God. And as for your people and their families and their homes, we would have them be blessed of God as well. Father, it truly begins at the point of our salvation. So if someone is feeling convicted today and drawn by the Holy Spirit of God, and they are willing to tell on themselves and say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. But I understand now, because God has opened up the eyes of my heart, and I'm able to see that what Jesus did on that cross, he did for me. And I want that to count for me. If they're willing to say, Lord Jesus, because of what you did by dying for me on the cross, I want to receive the gift of eternal life, which you, which you offer freely to me today. Lord, I receive that gift. I accept it. Please save my soul. Thank you for dying. Thank you for rising. And Lord, I don't want my life to be about me anymore. But I'm willing to give you everything that I am and say, Lord, here's my life. Please take my sin away and please replace it with what you have for me. If you're willing to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus today in, in salvation, then he'll save you today. Do that now in your seat. And if you do that, then come and talk to me about it after the service. But if you're here today, whether you're a mother, whether you're a father, whether you're a child, and you want to be blessed of God, and you want to say, you know what, my life is no longer my own, but I want to be a bond slave to Jesus. If that's your heart's desire, will you let it be known to God by lifting up your hand today? I don't want my life to be all about me anymore, but I want to take everything that I am, and I want to lay it at Jesus' feet. Lord, I am your servant if you're willing to say that like Mary did today, will you lift your hand up right now? You can put your hands down. Some of you couldn't raise your hand. And if you couldn't raise your hand to that, may I humbly suggest today that you may have an issue with your heart. Whatever it is that's preventing you from wanting the full blessing of God on your life, whatever it is that's holding you back from saying, Lord Jesus, here's my life, take me. I am completely yours. Whatever that is that's in between you and God, lay it down today because it's not worth it. And leave this place with victory. Father, I pray that you would achieve great victory today in the lives of your people so that they will be thoroughly right with you and know what it means to be able to praise you to praise you freely and openly with nothing in the back of their mind that they're holding on to. Teach us, Lord, to be able to praise you with unrestrained minds and unrestrained hearts and lips and help us to walk in the freedom that you provide. Lord, whatever that stronghold is, whatever that besetting sin is which is causing your beloved to stumble today, may they confess it for what it is, lay it down, allow it to be crucified, and to rise up in the resurrection life that is available for each and every believer today. I pray that you would do that in my life and in the lives of these, your people. In Christ's name we pray, amen.